study the plant life, study the, the structure, the petals, count the leaves, count the gills, count everything, and do our best to draw an accurate one-on-one, -on -one, meaning actual size, uh, drawing or painting of our subject. Um, but once all those little tiny sort of rigid rules are in place, that's where the art part comes in. Um, there's a, a wonderful division of our, our genre that's dedicated to botanical illustration, which are those stunning pen and ink drawings and dissections and things that people get really, really excited about and they're so well done. And that's sort of at the far end of the continuum. I'm at the other end where I like to take my subject and make it as super awesome as I can and excite the viewer and educate the viewer. So if we can do all that in a little tiny mushroom, then I think we're, we're on our, our path to success. Um, tonight, what I thought we'd do is our little lowly, tiny little mushroom. Can you guys all see that? I picked up. Margaret, before you go on, um, can you tell us just briefly a little bit about the painting behind you? Oh, yes. The um, one behind me here? Yes. The one behind you. <laughs> <laughs> This one is um, just a little clump of, I think they're just little velvet. Can Margaret speak louder? I can barely hear her. <clears throat> I can try, I'm yelling. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one behind me was part of my uh, six painting series for the New York Botanical Garden. And I chose clumps of mushrooms found very close to my house up on the mountain and um, painted them in watercolor. And that's what that is. Um, sort of a clump just dug out and placed in my studio and worked very quickly because mushrooms are like 96% water and they don't last long at all. So, and you also can't reconstitute them. When they're done, they're done. As anyone who ever pulled a slimy bag of mushrooms out of their refrigerator knows they don't last very long. So that's what that one is. So, um, what I thought we'd do first is I will show you just a couple of my mushroom paintings. And then from there, we're going to jump in and see what we can get done. Um, this is a slow moving genre. It takes me a long time to draw or paint something. So don't feel frustrated if you also take your time doing that. It's, it just, it takes a long time and that's perfectly fine. I have a mushroom sketchbook that I had started and we actually had done a class um, at Fleischer last year on um, mushroom sketchbooks and it was a lot of fun. But since it's morel season, I wanted to show you guys this. Here is a, um, a drawing of a little half free morel found nearby. And here's a cross section of a little black morel. And this is kind of a nice way to get your feet wet into mushroom drawing is to keep a sketchbook or a notebook where you can refer to it um, each year and sort of use it as a little chronological gauge of what's growing and what you're finding and when you're finding it. Um, I had the best intentions to do that, but I literally didn't do any more than this page. So maybe, maybe this year I'll get to it. But um, as you can see, the, ten the pencil technique we use in botanical art is that of a very fine, sharp point, making tiny, tiny little circles for coverage. We don't really see line, we see form. And I'll show you that when we get to this part. There's my little mushrooms. Um, and then at the far end of what we'll do tonight, uh, I will show you this quickly. Um, I started a shiitake on a piece of vellum, but here's a finished vellum painting. There's a glare, I apologize for that. but. And they're just going to see that. This is a, um, a honey mushroom. And it's done on vellum, which is, uh, in this case, calf skin. And this is graphite and watercolor. So it's a natural byproduct of the butchering industry. It's a skin, a calf skin. Uh, it's not stretched or mounted. It's just free floating in the frame but it has this wonderful pigmentation on it that I love. And I think it's extra creepy and I like to work it into my work. Um, so let me, uh, let me go on here. So that's that. When you look at a mushroom, you'll see that it's made up of basic parts and you have to look at it like you would a plant. You've got a cap 
and you've got the stem. And this is a gilled mushroom, which means these little fan-like structures that happen inside. And that's where the spores are that release when it's growing in the wild. These are cultivated. These are from the grocery store, well, specifically from the little organic market down the street. But um, we have some nice mushroom growers here in Berks County, so I'm, I'm lucky to be able to get these. What's really cool about them though, and as you really start to study it, you realize how much texture they really have. This mushroom offers a lot as far as interest, to me anyway. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's just a brown mushroom. Well, it can be. When you look at anything like this though, whether you're drawing a plant or you're drawing, oh, who knows, tomato, onion, there's a lot of things that fall in that category. The first thing we do is break it down into geometric shapes. And it seems simplistic, but it works. Now, I didn't work these up from this absolute same mushroom, so we're gonna have to think about this a little bit. But a mushroom truly is nothing more than a cone sitting on top of a cylinder. And in botanical art, our light source will come from the left, over the left shoulder. So it's sort of like, um, I'll show you an example. Here's a, a little mushroom painting, I'm sorry, onion painting, that you're gonna pretend is a mushroom. And see how it has a highlight? And that's where we're aiming our highlight in the upper left. And that's what gives it form. It allows the light to sort of cascade around and lets the object float off the page. Um, you see a lot of artwork where people haven't nailed that concept down. It looks a little flat and you don't want that. You wanna make sure that your work has volume and dimension and form. Um, and understanding light on form would be about the best start you could, you could give yourself. I use, um, for my pencil drawing, typically I use a lead holder like this. A lot of people aren't familiar with them. Um, I have regular pencils too. I mean, I have lots of stuff like that, but this suits me. I like the weight of it in my hand. I like that I can sharpen it super, super, super sharp. You know, you get to drop the lead out a bit. Get it in there. Use your little rotary sharpener and get it really, really sharp. Like, like a hypodermic needle sharp. Um, I usually use an HB lead. The holder brand itself doesn't matter so much. You find what's comfortable in your hand because you're gonna be holding it for a long time. Um, so the first thing I did was think about that this mushroom really reminds me of an umbrella. The stem, does not come out the front, it comes up through the middle. So, you know, if you were to break this off and see exactly where that is, you know, you're looking at it in the center, like a parasol. So when you draw it, you draw through, you know, you make a nice little gesture to get your pose of your mushroom. And you consider that this shiitake and a lot of them either have a button top up or down, like an indentation or a bump. So this one I have just a little ellipses sketch there. Following that, I draw through, and that goes for whether you're drawing a branch with flowers or a stem with a daffodil in the end. You want that line to go from the bottom to the top because a lot of times we imagine that we see things we don't, we try to connect like a flower and a stem and it's a little off. Um, it really is a, a good practice to get into sketching and drawing through from the start. And so that's what I did there. And this is just a little piece of tracing paper. Um, I like drawing on here. It's very smooth and very forgiving and cheap. I mean, I cut them and paste them and move them around and copy and trace off and it's just kind of nice. So after you were to draw. Quick question, Margaret. Go right ahead. Um, a couple of questions. So what kind of pencil is it that you're using specifically, maybe the brand? The brand. And what type of pencil sharpener do you recommend? So the holder, this one just happens to be my Prismacolor. I have a hunch it might have been left on my college stuff from like eons ago. Um, like I said, the holder doesn't matter so much as the lead. And the lead comes in this kind of whole thing and you buy, so these are all HB hardness, which is kind of the center of the 
the uh, lead hardness continuum. I always think of it as like middle C on the piano. If this is HB, um, H I think of as hard and B for black. So the higher the number, if you have like a 4B or 4H rather, that means it's getting harder. And then 4B would be softer because it's black and it's soft like charcoal almost. Um, I use pencil hardnesses that fall between the 2B and 2H range. Uh, I can get lots of lights and darks. I don't need to go real dark, dark, dark. Um, if you control your, your layering of your graphite, you can get as dark as you may need to get with maybe a 2B, maybe a 3B, unless you're doing like a walnut or something extra dark. As far as the, um, the sharpener, these are one of those little barrel sharpeners, those little rotary ones. This one's a Statler Mars one. Um, it's a little fun tip. You want to make sure when you're transporting this that you tape it shut. Don't just put it in a baggie because that's just powder graphite in there. And trust me, it goes everywhere. I take a piece of tape and I cover the hole and I tape it down and then it doesn't move. And then there's no bad surprises when you unpack your bag in front of a class <clears throat> or something like that. So that's the um, sharpener I use for this kind of pencil. Now, if I'm using um, just a regular lead pencil, like this, then I use one of these. And this is everyone's favorite sharpener because you're all going to be ordering it right now. It's called KUM Automatic Long Point. And what's nice about it, and I look, had a lot of pencil sharpeners, but this is the one that seems to really work. Um, the left side strips the wood off of it, and then the right side puts a point on it. And it's really super handy. So um, I'm sure we can start a list of little names of products or something uh, at some point, Vita, and, and make that available to people. There's a lot of, a lot of sure. Um, as far as erasers, I usually use a kneaded eraser, and I work with it in my hand all the time. I'm not exactly certain where it got to. But my other favorite eraser is called a Mono Zero by Tombow, and it's just a simple little hard eraser that I take an exacto knife and I can put a point on it, and I can get in and just really clean up a line or pick and push and pull, you know, it's just nice. So that's the other vital tool I use. Um, I'm left-handed, uh, which means I smear everything with my, the side of my hand. So I tend to keep a piece of tracing paper under my hand at all times when I'm drawing or painting, just so I don't go marching it across and ruining everything. The right-handers aren't gonna know what I'm talking about. The left-handers are like, oh my gosh, thank you for telling me that because it, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we've had that, that problem. I'm going to go to the next step if anybody has any other questions or supply questions or basic questions. So from this point, what I would do is take another piece of tracing paper and I might just lay it over my drawing. And the goal at this point is to create a line drawing of you see that? Yeah, there we go. To create a nice little line drawing of your subject. And I did this a little extra big because, well, we're on camera and you want to be able to see it. But um, that's what I did is I, you know, I studied my subject really carefully and I cleaned up my lines and I went in and I, I made sure that everything I thought to be remarkable or that I need to know about for a drawing is in place. And that's what I have. And these little drawings come in handy because you use them throughout to do other things. And I'll explain that too. Let's say you get your line drawing done and your, your apex piece of art is now going to be a graphite drawing. Um, there's really two approaches. Your graphite drawing can be your finished, your finished art. I do a quick tunnel drawing before I work up a painting. Um, our stuff is perishable. There's not a lot of chance to visit a piece of plant matter once it fades. I mean, there are botanical artists that wait the entire year cycle to come back and visit their plant because when it's gone, it's gone. Um, especially under these lights. I mean, it's kind of hot in here, quite frankly. Uh, the plants don't like that, neither do mushrooms. But what we do 
is here's the beginning of a, of a little graphite drawing of that mushroom. You guys can see that? Um, I'm conscious of my light source no matter what I do. I'm always thinking about where that light is hitting things. And I know there's bumps and there's little bruises and tears on this cap and on the stem. And I wanna make sure that I get things light enough and dark enough. And the motion for drawing and toning, and again, this is just on tracing paper. Typically, a good drawing would be executed on hot press watercolor paper. I paint on that and I draw on that. It's smooth, it's very forgiving, and the paper holds up well. Not cold pressed, not the bumpy stuff we're used to painting on in a different manner. This is, this is precise. This is, this is really, truly a very uh, delicate and refined way of, of working. Um, so you want to give yourself as many chances as you can to, to help yourself along. You want smooth. So between the sharp point and the smooth paper, and here's the exaggerated motion of what I'm going to do. It's little tiny circles that overlap on each other. To become, to make an area darker, I do not press harder. I just make another pass over it with my pencil. For instance, and this is where it gets a little, you know, I'm making, I'm still going a little bigger. I'm gently allowing my graphite to build up on its own. I'm picking a dark area to drop into. And I'm thinking about, as I go, just basic principles of drawing, a light source, light on form. I know this right edge is gonna drop off. It's gonna have a little light over here. The darkest part is going to be up underneath this cap. Light will never get there if the light's coming this way. And I build. Now down in this part of this particular stem, and you can sort of see what's happening as it sits out in the light, it gets weird. You can't see that either. It Margaret, gets question yeah. for you. So why do you not press harder but build up the tone? Why do that instead of just pressing harder? The goal, um, and what I was taught was, the goal is beautiful continuous tone with little to no pencil strokes showing. That's considered what they want to see at the, at, the, at the highest level of graphite. Um, a, I love a beautiful sketch as much as we all, everyone else does, you know, where you see that line fade off and, and those little, you know, kind of things. But this is about building a lineless form. So I don't know if that answers the question. Um, it really is just a, a gentle, gentle building up until the values start to fade into each other and, and distinct. Um, I do pop a little line work up, say, if, like on the cap, there's areas that are like speckly or freckly, or they uh, fracture. This is already starting to dry out, so you're gonna see little bits of things separate. Um, you know, the dark side might get a little tiny nick of a, of a piece of graphite just to kind of lift it off the surface. Um, but you just keep going back and building and building and building. There's a point where your paper isn't gonna accept any more graphite. Maybe it's six or seven passes. That becomes your 100% value. That becomes your, your darkest part on that particular subject. And then you go from there. Um, and you can go back and pull things out with an eraser if you like. And there's just beautiful graphite work done. It's, you know, every time you start a little drawing like this, you're like, oh, I should do this more often. But then you say that no matter what you're working with. So it's hard to decide. If I was doing this for um, a painting reference, I'd be working kind of fast. And I'd want to know where my lights and darks are. I would want to know any kind of like funky tears or weirdness happening. Um, because the mushroom may go away. Now, I could go to the store and get more of these, but if it's something I found out in the woods and brought back in, you know, April, and then I finally get around to working the painting up in September, that may be out of season, the subject may be long gone. So the sketching, um, your tonal drawing, any notes you might take, photos, sure, but we don't really work from photos. We try to work from life. And there's, there's good reasoning for that. You know, photos flatten things. And the goal is to depict our subject 
in a lifelike way. So we want to show form. We want to show that detail. So that's how I would proceed with, with that drawing. Um, but say you want to transfer your drawing onto a good piece of paper. Um, there's a cheap way to do that. I have one started, but I will show you. Here's another line drawing. I just traced it off my original drawing. I made a fake carbon paper. I'll assume that everyone knows what carbon paper is. It, they don't always know what carbon paper is. <laughs> it might be a bit of an age thing. What I do is I take a soft pencil, you know, something like a, this is a 5B, and you scribble on a piece of either cheap copy paper or tracing paper or something like that. And you're just making some graphite transfer. Margaret, quick question. Um, does the circular drawing technique create a texture? And what if you don't want a texture like that? If you're using a sharp enough pencil on a good quality paper, you won't see a texture. That's the, the goal is to not see a texture to it. Um, if you, if you want a texture and you, you want that, you know, maybe you're drawing and you want to see some nice little hatchy marks, that's fine too. That's your, that's your personal style of drawing. Um, what I'm sharing with you all is what I was taught as to be kind of what the botanical art world looks for in a graphite drawing. And that is continuous tone, if you think of it that way. But certainly, you know, if, if you rather see more of a sketchy look in your, in, your, in your drawings, then by all means, please do. So I do this. And there are products. I mean, there's stuff you can buy, transfer paper. But, you know, this is right here right now, and I didn't have to pay for can it. Can Fleischer make her speaker speak louder? Margaret, is, is it possible to bring your microphone a little bit closer to you? I can bring the laptop closer, I think, a little bit. And I'm kind of yelling, so I'm wondering, how's that? Yeah, and if, if you're having trouble hearing, Margaret, do turn up your microphone. Because some people are having issues with volume, but others are not. So it <laughs> might... It, <laughs> Your, your voice, Vita, is much louder than Margaret's. It, there might be a difference, but um, yeah, turning up your volume would, would be helpful. I'll try to yell a little bit more. <laughs> so then I lay um, my transfer paper over. I should do this first. Hang on. Use the tape. Any um, major drawing or painting has a tracing paper version of it that I refer to and I use. And I tape it on the right side because I'm left-handed. And I keep that on for the duration of my painting because a lot of times on a very intricate piece, you lose your way. You could, you could be working up the center of an orchid and You've got a few layers of paint on there and you've lost your pencil line and you know, then what? Um, if you have your drawing taped and anchored, you can retransfer tiny sections back on top of your painting, which is a godsend because, you know, you need to see your line. Um, all right. So then I slide this underneath and I trace it off. Uh, something I was taught that works really well and it works great on a very complex drawing is if you use a very thin, a colored pencil rather than more graphite, you can see exactly where you were. Sometimes people want to know why you don't just scribble on the back of your drawing. And the, the answer is one, I reuse my drawing sometimes. And if you do that, you completely lose your, the front, you can't see it. And it gets all messy and dirty and sticky up. So Margaret, is the graphite face down or is it face up? It's face down. And uh, yes, I have done entire tracings with it facing the wrong way. So um, <clears throat> it seems silly, but marking front and back is helpful. And I tell my students all the time, is this a mistake that I'm pointing out? 
rest assured, I've made it many, many times. That's why it's so important that I point it out. But uh, yeah, so the graphite side goes down and I'm gonna just do a little bit of this. You know, you wanna press firmly, but you also wanna be cautious that you don't um, score your paper with your sharp pencil either, because that can lead to trouble when you're watercoloring, it'll pull into the, into the marks. So there's the red, you can sort of see it on there. And then you pull this out and there's your, there's your transfer. So could you use a light table to do this? I do sometimes use a light table. It works for um, thin paper and it works for vellum. It doesn't work for 300 pound watercolor paper. And um, lately I've been sort of fooling around with egg temper and it wouldn't work on a board on a board either because you can't really see through it. So uh, of course the cheapest method of all is holding it up to a window and tracing it through in, in daylight. But then all the blood runs out of your hands from holding it up too long and it's a mess too. So, um, but yeah, I, I do use a light table and mine has a little bit of an angle and that's kind of nice because I usually just keep working on it. So then you have your image transferred. From that point, once it's on your good paper, my good paper, the hot press, you can go ahead and build up a nice watercolor, I'm sorry, a, a graphite drawing or that can be the beginning of your watercolor. And that's what I'll show you next. Grab a sip of water. When I say watercolor, I want you not to think about watercolor in the traditional sense of lots of puddliness. We're talking watercolor in a dry brush technique that is almost like a damp brush with dry paint. This is my palette. This is my watercolor palette. There it goes. Um, it's set up obviously by reds, yellows, and blues. Um, they're either Winsor Newton or Daniel Smith. I squirt out the tubes into the wells and let them dry. Um, the way that I paint, I like a very concentrated pigment because of my next step and I'll show you that. Over here are my sort of fungi colors. Um, there's a brown that I'm a little in love with that I use all the time and it's Paraline Maroon Quinacridone Gold and either Ultramarine Blue or Windsor Violet. And it makes just this really great brown. Uh, we paint a lot of brown. Everyone thinks botanical art, oh it's green. It's more brown. <laughs> We've got brown leaves and brown mushrooms and brown bark and you name it. So to me, that's kind of the color that you need to really have control over. Um, and what, what works for me as an artist and as someone who really likes color um, is to have a lot of control over it. When I make a brown, and let's just say we're, we're using Perlene Maroon and Quinn Gold and Windsor Violet, which are here. I have the luxury of mixing them together and I also have the ability to use them independently as a little tiny bit of a wash underneath my colors and that's what gives it a lot of extra sparkle. It can take sort of a mundane plant, piece of a plant, mushroom, what have you, and give it a sparkle and a little bit of life. Um, it works for all colors. I mean if you mix a green gosh, why not use all the colors in that green elsewhere in your painting in different proportions or underneath? Um, and I'll show you what I mean there. I also, uh, I'm trying to think, most of these colors in here are transparent or translucent. And that's important to me when I paint on vellum. And the whole point of painting on vellum, but the painting that's behind Vita in her, her window is on a giant piece of vellum. Um, vellum is translucent. So when you paint on it with transparent or translucent paint, the light is able to bounce around from all sides and come up through the vellum, through the paint. And that's why it looks like it glows. It's just a, it's just a neat combination. What I do is I take some paint from my palette and I make this kind of a splotch thing on a, on a white plate. Um, there are two kind of basic approaches that people use to botanical art. They make tea washes and build up lovely, lovely washes 
where they have gradations and beautiful leaves that take form and so forth. Um, I've never had a lot of success painting like that, quite frankly. I, I, like the, I like the idea of almost drawing with my brush and that's how I started to paint. So what I do, the first, the first lap around would be something like this. I've transferred my mushroom to the watercolor paper. I've kind of messed around with some colors that I wanted to see. Just kind of just put them there. The brush that I use, and I'm not the only one. There are, there are a lot of brushes out there. You guys know it because we all own them all, right? The brush that makes me the happiest is this Da Vinci number no. four Maestro. It's a long point. And the thing you want to look for if you're going to work in this type of detail, and just know I paint everything with this brush from the tiniest stamen and pistol to the longest bit of a branch. It all comes out of this brush. It's because of the tip. And I'm constantly dipping in water and I use these little, it's like a Swedish dishcloth, you know what I mean? Like one of these things, they call it whatever they want to, like this is supposed to keep acrylics moist, but you know, whatever. Um, I'm always twirling my brush, always, 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 to get a point. And it, it, it's hard to imagine, but you can go for quite a long time with paint up into your brush that slowly, slowly tapped out with that tiny little point. Um, and I hope you can see it as I go. There's some lines down here that I made, and I'm not sure, you, I'll use a darker color. I swish it like this and I twirl it in my paint I twirl it off again and then you get this tiny dry little see that's almost too wet a little tiny mark that you just keep building up and building up and building up on your painting. The first thing I did on this is, and I did this earlier because it really does have to dry, is I laid down some very faint washes simply to remind myself about the form. I wanna make sure I remember that this is the dark side and that there's no light here and eventually there'll be gills up in here um, and so on. I put down some perylene, I put down a little bit of blue, a little bit of brown, I just sort of slopped it in there. It really doesn't matter what is on there as long as they're all roughly the same value, you're gonna be covering it anyway. And I mean really covering it, um, layer upon layer. And I'll show you. So I was starting, and maybe if you're painting along, lay some washes down on a section and give it a chance to dry. And then maybe you wanna just try some dry brush marks somewhere else in your paper. But you know, you're holding your brush upright. You're, you're kind of getting up on the tip. You're not pressing hard. You just wanna just give it a tiny little whiskery, whiskery, whiskery mark. And that's what I did here. I started this section and you keep going over it and you can mix up your colors. The reason they're on the plate like this is because the next time I dip onto here, I'll drag my brush through a different section, pick up something else, wipe it off, and start again. And just keep kind of nicking away at it. And that gentle, and I don't want to call it hatching because it really, you're not crossing anything. You're always painting in the direction of growth. Um, human eyes are super, you know, we see things that are wrong and we don't know why. Like if you don't draw through your, your twig on the other side of the leaf or, or it's off like a 64th of an inch, your eye's going to pick that up and it's going to be sort of disconcerting and you're going to not be, you know, as relaxed as you should be when you look at botanical art. So you, know, you want to draw in the direction of growth, paint in the direction of growth, and um, make, it, make it interesting. So that's what I'm doing. And I'll do a little bit of this in this color, so hopefully you can see some progress. I'm going up the side, if it was like this. I'm going up this dark side. And I'm gonna worry about all that extra little detail a little later on 
that doesn't have to be dealt with now. Right now, we want to get the shape of the mushroom. We want to understand the structure. We want to, and you believe me, you're really going to know it well by the time you're finished. You spend enough time staring at it. Um, but it gets interesting, you know, where the dark part is. You go over it a little more or choose a different color. And you kind of just start. Anybody have any questions so far? Not okay. yet. That's because they're all painting, right? <laughs> Probably. It looks like it. So um, that's the way I'd approach that. Now, the next step, my painting is fairly, fairly far along. And I should probably cut to that, right? Maybe I'm watching the time. Yeah. I'm going to say this is all but done. Here we go. One question is, what happened to the pencil line? Oh, well, you, for one thing, you really cover it up. Um, if it's a light subject, um, you want to go in with a kneaded eraser, and you want to pull that line up as soon as you can. There are certain colors that are a bit of a nightmare. I'm glad you asked that question, yellow being one of them. If you lock in a color with yellow watercolor, I'm sorry, lock in a graphite line with yellow watercolor, you're in trouble because you can't get it out. Um, I can erase through watercolor. Uh, but for the most part, like here, you, you never see a pencil line at this point. So here's my little mushroom. Also, one question is, uh, what do you mean by the direction of growth? So, so if I was painting here, I'm following the very, the little tip, and I'm working my way up. Imagining that the growth, the, the cap, comes down like this like a, you know, stripe. I wouldn't make a line that goes like this, like across it. It would be kind of, just like in the stem. I, I wouldn't be making, and my lines would follow the stem. They won't cut across this way, because that would be jarring. I'm just gonna paint along the edge. And do you ever paint shadows on the background? So shadows when, of the subject? Yep, um, no. So one of the conventions of botanical art is um, that we don't include cast shadows because then it implies that it's a still life. Not that there's anything wrong with still lives, but there are certain ideas about botanical art um, that it's to feature that plant in its all its beauty. And you know, one of the neat things we do is show the apple blossom, the bare twig in the winter, the blossom, the tiny apple, the medium apple, the full-size apple, the decaying apple, and so forth, all in one painting. Um, it's about the plant first. And I think the, the convention is, you know, you start adding shadows and getting a little tricky or bases or whatever, and then it no longer is about the plant. So that's, that's the, what I was told and, and seen, understand about, about the whole thing. Can you paint a lighter color over a darker one? No, not really. So we do not use white, and we really don't use black out of the two. We mix it as dark as we can, because a true black sometimes can be overpowering. Um, the idea is to keep your paint fairly transparent um, and either build your colors through layering or try to nail your local color right off the bat. So local color meaning if I asked you what color a banana is and you said yellow, that would be the local color. Um, in painting something like a banana, I would build my shadows out of purple and then work the, the, the very most layer would be the yellow. You would let it kind of build up. How many layers will it generally take to, to build up the surface? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> it depends what your subject is. Um, you know, if it's an elegant daffodil where you want that translucency and you throw it on with some washes, you leave it go. You know, you know when you've got it. But if you're painting an eggplant where you need that, that heaviness and that density, but a shine, you're going to have to really work at it. If you just mix purple and it's not going to work. You, you need to um, build your form through knowledge of color, if that makes sense. And do you have to let each layer dry every time you add a new layer? 
yes. Um, the dry brush is dry by the time I go back to it after I get more paint. It truly takes no time at all. Um, it's kind of forgiving in that respect. So you can you can dance around a painting pretty well. Uh, people work in different different ways. Sometimes they they touch the whole painting at once. You know what I mean? They work the whole thing up. Other people start and work up just one section and finish it and then move on to the next and the next. Um, but it dries very quickly. We're using so little paint. I mean, really, little tiny, tiny little unicorn eyelashes full of paint. I mean, there's there's like nothing here. Don't let that stop me from buying more paint, though. We all have plenty of paint, but um, it's really, really, really not not a lot of paint, not a lot of water at all. So that's on paper, and that that water absorbs very quickly into the paper, which is another reason it dries so quickly. But lastly, if I were to be working this up on vellum. That's where you really have to back off the water. Because if anybody's ever, say, forgotten their ice scraper and wiped off a wet windshield with a, or ice with a leather glove on and then watched it dry, that's what happens to vellum. It gets dry and crunchy and distorted and mangled. Um, you really can't use water on vellum. Um, I tape it down. This is a piece I tape down. I have my drawing transferred. And I slap a very, very light, quick, very quick wash on there. But from that point, it's it's all dry brush. And I mean, drier than I did on paper. Um, it's wiggling and wiping. But if you like to paint, but you really like to draw too, this might be a very satisfying way for you to achieve your art, you know, and the nice end result with your artwork. It truly is like drawing with a brush. Um, it can be, it can just be very elegant. And the amount of detail that you're able to get is always astonishing. That you're able to just, you know, drop in little tiny pairs of paint and, and indicate little tiny lines. It's pretty cool. And that's what I would do. I always drop my brush into the darkest section because nobody likes a surprise, like a splotch of paint squirting out or something awful. And, um, you know, I keep dancing around. I'm not one that works in the same spot each time. I tend to move around. I pay particular attention to the gills. Um, they're a real pain to draw. The gills are sort of like a they're not very evident here, but some bigger mushrooms have enormous gills and they form around the center. And they're sort of like rubbery pages of a paperback book. Like they're just, they're not regular. They're, they're all different thicknesses and, and shapes and the line, you know, when you were in like seventh grade and you drew mushrooms all over stuff and you put those black lines in, you were drawing the gills. But what we're doing and what that attempt was you're drawing the shadow of one gill overlapping another. So each gill has a thickness. And that's where people get all batty about it because they change direction and so forth. So that's more fun. You can see inside of it. There's not much happening there. There's your gill work. These aren't very thick at all. So you could indicate them very gently with just a little bit of gray or just a little bit of a shadow. You wouldn't have to go, go crazy with it. So I guess the idea is, if you love mushrooms and you've decided you want to include them into your, in your artwork, you should go out and look for them and gather them. Sketch them where you find them. Make some notes. Talk about where you saw them and the temperature and so forth. Um, we're going to have to. I don't know why she shut off. Um, and from that point, we're just going to Bring it back if you can. Um, sometimes there's different rules apply to different states, but in Pennsylvania state parks, you are allowed to uh, to take mushrooms. Although you might want to just verify that. Um, if there's different rules according to where you are, so always ask if you're on private property. Uh, there's usually no shortage of them if you like them. Um, when we had the class at Fleischer, people would find them walking to class, like, you know, in a flower box or something. So that was kind of cool. But um, 
Yeah, I hope people draw mushrooms. They're kind of neat. <laughs> Um, a couple more questions. Um, how might, how much time, uh, might you spend on a graphite drawing or watercolor painting? Well, I guess it depends on the subject. Um, probably usually three or four times as much time as you think it's going to take. Um, there's something very, well, you know how it is. You get about 20 minutes into something and you can just feel yourself relax and you don't want it to stop and, and you just, you just want to keep going with it. Um, 10, 20, 30 hours, it depends. Uh, I seldom wow. finish something. The one that's behind Vita took a long time and that wasn't even completely worked up. That, I, I, I the part in the front that's in, you know, all the color, um, that's highly detailed and the rest sort of just is what's in the background. But, you know, that's like a, that's a 30 hour painting, I would say. It's pretty big too. Mm-hmm. Um, and in botanical illustration, how precise do you have to be about like the number of gills or other details like number of leaves or petals? Are you trying to be as precise as possible? Yes, you should be. Um, you know, invariably, the time that you don't count the rhododendron leaves and you have a painting, say, it's flower show or something, the president of the rhododendron society will come along and point out that you don't have the right amount of leaves. <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, there's always someone checking uh, nomenclature that it's named correctly, and they encourage you to use a plant key and find out what is typical for that particular plant. Like, you know, is it supposed to have five petals, and, and is it supposed to have this or that? Um, there's a lot of ab abnormalities out in nature. The plant you might pick to draw may not be the best example of that plant. So check a few and pick something. But if you're painting for pleasure, um, paint what you like. Don't get all hung up in the details. If you're painting for a show or you're painting for something a little more at that level, then yeah, you're gonna have to put the, put the time into the research. Because it's embarrassing if someone finds out that you didn't. <laughs> it's usually the hard way, so. Yeah. Well, wonderful, that's amazing. Um, let's see, one more question, a couple more questions. Uh, how often does text get added to the plant as in the name of the subject and what specific needs to be focused on that text? Uh, you mean writing actually on the painting with it? Right. They, they discouraged us from doing that um, in, in my training. And it's it, the reason I heard made me sort of stop and think, but I think they're right. Most people have not that great a handwriting and they can't spell. And it sounds brutal, but it's true. They've said, we've seen paintings that should have been RHS award winners and something was spelled incorrectly on it. So what they do is suggest that all your information go either on the back or on your entry card or, or in your title, but not on the painting. In fact, uh, when we do uh, scans for our catalogs and in our journal, nine times out of 10, we take out the signature digitally. Um, just because sometimes people place it in a, maybe a distracting spot or, um, I don't know, too prominently. I just really want to focus on the botanical object. Yeah, you do. It's about the plant first. Um, of course, it's always about, a little about the artist too, but you can sneak that in there. <laughs> Um, could you tell us the four colors you were using for the mushroom again? Sure. We call it the ultimate brown, ultimate fungi brown. Um, it's paraline maroon, which I think if you paint in any subject matter, you're going to love this color. That's a Daniel Smith color. Uh, quinacridone gold, that's also one of his colors. And then the other two, depending how you want to shift it, if you want to be cold or warm, uh, would be either Windsor Violet or good old ultramarine blue. And that just really keeps a, a great, just it's just a really constant brown. And you can shift it one direction or another, depending on what you're painting. You want it to be more blue or purple or whatever. Um, it's, it's just a good little brown to have in your arsenal. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was besides... Say, don't mix more than three colors or they're gonna get really muddy. You know, don't, don't do one of those swirlies where you got all your colors mixed together to make brown. You can control those colors a little better if you only use three. Besides yourself, um, who is your favorite botanical artist? Besides myself. Um, my favorite botanical artist, 
honestly, I, I have the book right here. The, the, the person, and it's an odd choice, the person that turned me on to this mushroom business was Beatrix Potter, pre-bunny, not the bunny part. She was an amateur mycologist and she did work like this in the field. She in the field. In the field. She was so ahead of her time. She wrote papers on mushrooms. She tried to get them published. She couldn't because she was a woman and they didn't like that kind of thing. Um, but her handling of, of, of nature objects uh, is just exquisite. There's a collection at the Armit Museum in, um, in England. If you ever get a chance, uh, plenty of books is a great biography of her. Um, it's just, I don't know, again, pre-bunny. I mean, the bunnies are fine, but I don't paint bunnies, so. <laughs> <laughs> she had like a whole other life before the bunny. Cool, well, that's great. I think that's all the questions we have tonight. Thank you so much for your time, for this really terrific presentation. It was really fabulous. Thank you. And I, I appreciate so many people coming to meet together. And I hope the lure of the mushroom was what brought you all here. And again, even if you just draw one thing when you're out in the woods, I mean, let's face it, we all have a little extra time on our hands right now. Um, just to connect with something in nature is so meaningful. And I honestly think it's, it's a, it was such a part of everyone's childhood, I bet. Um, I hear that most of the time. Oh, I remember this, I remember that. And what better way to celebrate that than to just take some time and do a little drawing. It'll just be for you. Beautiful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you everyone for joining us. It was a really great pleasure to see so many familiar faces. I hope you enjoy your evening and join us again next week for another Fleischer from a Distance. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye, Margaret. Bye. Bye.